Welcome to the Monday, May 10th, uh, 2010 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Deb Duane, do the roll call. Chair Swift Kayata. Here. Councilor Guvenali. Here. Councilor Jordan. Here. Councilor Lennon. Here. Councilor Sherman. Here. Councilor Sullivan. Here. Councilor Walsh. Here. Thank you. Uh, Town Council reports and correspondence. Oh, sorry. By the allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, our nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Town Council reports and correspondence. David? Uh, I will be attending a, another meeting of the Municipal Operations Review Committee this coming Thursday as our work continues. Thank you. Penny? Uh, yes, I just wanted to um, announce for people who uh, have not already seen this on the website that there is a vacancy on the planning board. Um, which uh, Beth Richardson, who had uh, been in that position, which I thank her very much for all of her wonderful service. Um, her term, it, the term is set to expire on 12-31-2012, and we are going to be accepting applications for the planning board up until uh, May 24th and then we will be reviewing those applications in anticipation of uh, making a recommendation at the June 2010 um, council meeting. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that that opening <coughs> exists. Any others? Um, the first meeting of the uh, Open Space Management Committee will be held tomorrow evening directly following the Conservation <coughs> Commission meeting here in the Jordan, Con no, it's upstairs, isn't it, Maureen? Upstairs in the, uh, near the Planning Board office. Thank you. And uh, just for the record, the uh, Fort Williams Advisory uh, Group is meeting on the 20th of May, and uh, they're in their ongoing discussions about other funding sources for the park, and uh, Sarah Lennon, and I will be in attendance at that meeting um, on the 20th, and it will be held at the uh, Public Works at 7 o'clock. Thank you. I have one more thing. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I had uh, met with the Cape Elizabeth Recycling Committee regarding the uh, pay per throw um, option for. Um, the recycling center, and they had uh, forwarded a, uh, a memo along to the town council regarding uh, pay to throw, which we will be taking up at a workshop. I believe we're doing environmental issues in July. Is that right, Mike? July? The night of the July council meeting. Okay. Thanks. That's it. I just wanted to quickly explain the only reason I'm sitting in this chair is Councillor swift Kayata has a severe case of laryngitis and can't speak. I think if she could speak at all, she'd be here, so <laughs> pinch hitting. Uh, and secondly, I wanted to just quickly announce that the Cool Cape group that's a branch of the Sierra Club that works in local um, towns, that group is hosting a movie called Trashed that is um, a documentary and it's all about the, essentially about the garbage business in the United States. Um, it's, I have not seen it, but it's, it's, the woman I work with said it's absolutely fascinating. Um, it says, uh, trashed examines the American waste stream approaching half a billion tons annually and just what happens, where it goes, the politics, et cetera, et cetera. I think it will be really interesting. It's on uh, Wednesday, May 19th at 7 o'clock. It takes an hour, so the showing will be from 7 to 8. They were hoping to start at 6.30 and have some refreshments and a little discussion, and then a half hour afterward to maybe come up with some action items and a plan. So again, Wednesday, May 19th at 7 p.m., the film Trashed will be screened here in the council chambers for all those who are interested. Uh, okay, so at this time we have, we take a moment to listen to citizens um, who want to 
talk about anything, any item that is not on the agenda for this evening. Feel free to come forward. Seeing none, town manager's report. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Sarah. I wanted to give a brief report this evening. Uh, first, I wanted to make note that we're continuing to pave some of our roads. Uh, part of Stonegate was done, Manta Road, uh, Macaulay Road this past week. Uh, we're going to be moving uh, this summer uh, over to doing uh, some more on the western side of town, particularly around Valley Road, uh, up in that neighborhood off, off Pleasant Avenue. Uh, also part of Route 77 uh, down in the vicinity of Rudy's. Some of you have noticed that road is uh, beginning to, to deteriorate uh, quite, quite a bit of late. Uh, so and we're also going to do, be doing a little bit this summer at the, the entrance to the refuse disposal area as you recycling centers. You go in Dennison Drive, you might note that it's a mishmash there of different paving and really starting to, to deteriorate. So that, you know, the, the work that began last week that we'll be wrapping up uh, hopefully in the coming, uh, later this week or in the coming week depending on uh, the weather, uh, putting the final code pavement on those roads and the others will be mostly done uh, during the month of July. So there'll be, there'll be quite a bit of paving. Uh, secondly, I did want to mention, because we'll, we'll be getting some questions likely, is that a number of uh, proposals that have been approved over the last few years are actually starting to begin activity. Uh, Eastman Meadows, uh, which is off Eastman Road, uh, which is a development that's primarily centered for age 50 and over. Uh, that particular development is expected to get underway with construction uh, next month. Uh, it was approved uh, well over a year ago, uh, slowed down with the, 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 uh, the economic activity like all the others, uh, but that will be underway. Secondly, Spurwink Woods, another development uh, that went through an extensive re review process, uh, which is uh, off uh, Stevenson Street, which is off Spurwink, and down in the South Street neighborhood, there's going to begin to be some construction uh, in that activity as well with some of the, the initial homes. Uh, of that particular subdivision. Uh, thirdly, I think a, a lot more evident now is that the, the property that was originally the Viking Nursing Home in Crescent House uh, and later Haven Healthcare, uh, that property is also, uh, they've torn down the old nursing home part of the, the facility and they've taken out the permit for the foundation uh, for that new building so that that is under construction and we anticipate that the, the remaining permit for the, uh, the remainder of the building will be taken out fairly soon. So, you know, you look at that combined, uh, you know, there's uh, going to be quite a bit of economic activity within Cape Elizabeth uh, that we haven't really seen at all in the last uh, two years. So that, you know, I, I think a sign that, you know, whether one likes the development or not, it, it is a sign that we're, we're pulling out of the recession, at least here in Cape Elizabeth. and. Uh, you know, in, in many respects, you know, there will be some impacts, both positive and negative, uh, around the community uh, as, as we look at the activity with, the, with those particular uh, developments. Uh, I also did want to mention, and we do this from time to time, uh, we, we lost a number of notable citizens in, in the last month and a half, uh, all of whom who, who really significantly served the community. Bob Smith, some of you may have remembered, uh, he served with Penny's father uh, on the town council. Uh, back in the, the mid-1970s, he was really instrumentally involved. He headed something called the Urban Renewal Authority that, that Cape Elizabeth had. It was, it was a grant that uh, the town received, and they did, at that point, a master plan for what Fort Williams might look at, you know, if, if there were various things, partially commercial, partially uh, park, looked at many different alternatives. Uh, you know, over the years, he contributed an awful lot with, of his talent and time particularly to issues involving Fort Williams, but served on the town council for six years and, uh, you know, was, was really uh, an important figure in the community, particularly uh, during the, the 1970s. Uh, second, Judy Simons, uh, very unexpectedly, uh, to many of us, passed away uh, a couple weeks ago. Judy is a recipient of the Ralph Gould Award, uh, served as a member of the Cape Elizabeth School Board, uh, was one of the founders of the Arts Commission and was one of the founders of the Community Garden uh, that's, that's over on the Galcrest property. Uh, her husband, Steve, as many of you know, was also the town council chairman uh, back in the, I believe it was the 1980s. And 
and he was one, also one of the leaders of one of the major Fort Williams committees. So, you know, both Simons have contributed so much to the community over the years, and, and Judy in particular with, with the schools and the arts, and uh, really, really, I think was the impetus behind the, the community garden uh, that's, that's over at the Gullcrest uh, property. Uh, Jim Jordan passed away. Uh, Jim, uh, wife Barbara, was our town treasurer uh, for, for many, many years, was, was here when I first came to Cape Elizabeth. Uh, actually, she was the, the deputy treasurer at that point. Jenny Murray was the treasurer. But uh, her husband, Jim, passed away. And Jim we, was uh, very active in the insurance community in the region. But you know, the, the particular reason, I don't mention all citizens uh, you know, when we, we do these these updates, but Jim was an elected water district trustee uh, for the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, so, you know, along with Bob and Judy, we actually we had three past elected officials who really served Cape Elizabeth ably in, in really the, the three local elected positions that we have that represent the town locally uh, with the water district, the school board, and the town council. Uh, John Seraldo uh, was a very well-known attorney in town, uh, chaired our planning board for a couple of years, served on the planning board for a number of years. Uh, you know, cer certainly, uh, you know, even when he was, was ill, did so much for the community. Uh, you know, during, uh, you'd particularly in the last 10 years, and, you know, really saddened that he passed away. Uh, finally, uh, you know, it's funny, you, you find out about different people. Phil Harley is, is a person that a lot of people knew in Cape Elizabeth uh, and respected. Phil was, uh, you know, back in World War II, very active, and you know, I, I was aware that he, you know, had, had done an awful lot back in that time. But uh, you know, I used to see him here. His wife Jane worked with Barbara Adams uh, doing the absentee voting here in the council chamber before the, the different elections. But what I was talking to Ike Johnson, who is a longtime member of the Lions Club, uh, the other night, and Ike told me that Phil, as much as anyone in the Lions Club was responsible for the development of the original Lions Field. And, you know, physically went down there and helped to build that Little League field. And, you know, it, it's sometimes unfortunate, it's only after when people pass away, you find out what they, what they did. And, you know, Phil, you know, Phil, as well as all these individuals, really did so much to make Cape Elizabeth what it is today. And I think it was uh, worth noting, uh, particularly that we, we've had so many citizens uh, who have done so much that uh, have uh, passed away. In, in just the last five or six weeks. So I wanted to make mention of them and remember them and thank them for their service to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, review of the minutes of the meeting held April 12th, 2010. Does anybody have any? Oh, I guess we need a motion. Move to approve the minutes from the April 12th meeting. Second. Any additions, edits, nothing. All in favor? Unanimous. Um, next, we take up the agricultural amendments. Um, Dave, can I turn to you, the chair of the ordinance committee, to introduce it? Certainly. And you want me to do that, and then we'll go to the public hearing? I think so, yeah. Certainly. Um, uh, the uh, proposed zoning amendments that relate to agricultural uses have been the uh, culmination of many years' worth of hard work uh, from members of the community, uh, uh, the town planner, the comprehensive planning committee, uh, as well as then a group that was formed recently, the Cape Farm Alliance. Uh, and uh, I, as a member of the ordinance committee, uh, had the pleasure of working with all of these folks uh, and uh, we'll hear more from the town planner and others tonight as to what this all means, but essentially the goal here is to make Cape Elizabeth um, a more viable community uh, for farming uh, operations to uh, succeed and thrive in. And uh, I'm very excited about these amendments. I'm looking forward to hearing from, uh, I see some members of the Cape Farm Alliance here tonight, um, and I am hopeful we'll be able to move this forward. Thank you. Maureen, do you want to give us a background? Sure. I was here last month when you were discussing the town center amendments, and so this is kind of the same thing again. Um, the comprehensive plan has 91 recommendations. 33 of them have been identified as high priority 
which means they have to be they have to be um, implemented in the first three years. Um, the agricultural amendments. So well is it? Here we go. So this is just more of implementing the 2007 comprehensive plan, um, and you'll keep hearing the same things. So the 2007 comprehensive plan adopted by the council in 2007, it had 91 recommendations. Um, the expectation is over time between now and the year 2020 that you would implement almost all of the 91 recommendations. But there are 33 that are identified as high priority, which means they have to be, ad have to be adopted in the first three years. So we're, we're, we're rapidly approaching our goal here. Uh, we took those 33 recommendations and the ordinance recommendation portion of those, we tried to assemble them into five different packages just for ease of implementing and trying to meet the deadline. You've already adopted the Shoreland Zoning Update Package. You've already adopted the BA District Package. So this is the third coming before you is the agricultural uh, amendments. There, the comprehensive plan has 15 chapters. 14 of them are subject chapters. The agricultural and forestry chapter the goal in that chapter is that the town shall support the continuation of farming and management of woodland areas by working with farmers and landowners to provide for financial rewards and preservation of significant agricultural and forestry areas. So this is what we're supposed to be trying to accomplish with the work that you're going to consider tonight. Uh, but there were three recommendations under that goal. One was to prepare an agricultural profile and the Cape Farm Alliance very ably stepped forward and at almost no cost to the town, I think there was no cost at all, actually did, did number 73 and prepared a report for the council and that's been submitted and accepted. 74 is basically uh, a bunch of recommendations for regulations uh, in, uh, introducing some more flexibility for farmers to implement that goal. And then 75 is an ongoing item where we're, we're continuing to do education with available tax benefit programs. So 74 specifically says to identify and modify town regulations that hamper the flexibility needed to make farming economically viable. And then the review shall include at a minimum um, looking at the minimum lot size that's required if you want to open a fish and farm market. Looking at temporary buildings that are needed for agricultural worker housing. Um, do we make those available or are they difficult to get? Uh, looking at agricultural related accessory buildings and uses and seeing whether there's some flexibility where we allow those. Looking at the agricultural definition itself and updating it. Looking at agriculturally related products and uses. And there's some really interesting new information out there and I don't have to tell Councillor Jordan this, but um, one of the new things that farmers are doing is they're finding ways to add value to their products by doing some processing, um, not just selling a bushel of uh, strawberries, but maybe also selling strawberry preserves so that the modern lifestyle actually promotes doing that and it's a way for farmers to earn more income than, than just selling the produce. And then restrictions on how much of a farm market can be stocked with what we would call non-farm or non-local produce. And this is again trying to make a farm market economically viable if you have a customer base. They, if you want to attract them back on a regular basis, there has to be some expectation that they're going to find what they want when they come. And when you have some seasonal variety in what's available, you need to be able to fill in the shelves with other things. Um, so just a reminder again that the main state statutes say that your zoning ordinance has to be consistent with your comprehensive plan, which is why we have this comprehensive plan, we have these recommendations, and now we're, adopt we're, we're considering adoption of new amendments to the zoning ordinance that will hopefully be consistent with the comp plan. Uh, the amendments themselves, as, as already mentioned by Councillor Sherman, a huge amount of influence from the Cape Farm Alliance, which is good since they're pretty much the user group for these amendments. Planning Board spent a lot of time drafting them, and the Ordinance Committee, I think, spent a decent amount of time refining them. Uh, the summary of the amendments, and you have the text, I'd be happy to go into as much detail as you want, or I can stop soon. Uh, but there's a new agricultural definition, and it really is intended to broadly define agriculture, 
specifically includes riding stables. Right now, there is a current decision by the code officer that riding stables are, are not a permitted use in Cape Elizabeth, so we need to fix this one right away. Um, there's a new agricultural related use definition, and what this is is kind of a big ag uh, umbrella approach that if you're a farmer and you come up with an idea for something you can do on your property and it relates to agriculture, it's a permitted use. Um, Farm market definition. Right now, a uh, farm market can have up to 25% of the stuff they sell be non-farm related. And this is increasing that percentage to 50%. So 50% of what you have for sale has to be from the farm, and it can be the shelf-stable stable products, but it has to be 50%. Uh, the current ordinance says it has to be grown on your farm. The new proposal says it has to be grown on land in Cape Elizabeth, so there's some flexibility there. 50% uh, is also averaged annually over an entire year, so in the middle of the summer when you've got a lot of strawberries, um, you can take advantage of that from when in the spring and the fall you may have fewer local vegetables. And it also addresses outdoor display area. If you have outdoor display area, you can count um, that towards the calculation of are you meeting your 50%. And you can count as much outdoor display area as you have in square footage of indoor display area. So there's some limits there. Uh, and also we, we did uh, make a little change to the fish market definition to update it with these same things for the farm market. Uh, we made agriculture related use, that new kind of ancillary use, we made it a permitted use in the RA, the RB, the RC districts, the town center, and the BA districts. Uh, we eliminated the special setbacks for farm markets, so they now have to comply with the same setbacks anyone else in those districts would have to comply with. Uh, we also made agriculture a permitted use in the resource protection district. Uh, there was a specific how you treat a non-conforming agricultural uses under the shoreland zoning. And as you know, under shoreland zoning, we can't make changes to that without submitting it to the state DEP, and they can reject our changes. Uh, the change we wanted to make, they would not look favorably upon. But they would allow us to make the change if we made agriculture a permitted use in the Resource Protection District. So this is the way to deal with a, an issue that was raised by the Cape Farm Alliance and still comply with the state minimums on the shoreland zoning. And then there was a whole set, there was a whole section in the ordinance that talked about when site plan review was required. We eliminated that section because there's a separate section that talks about when site plan review is required. When you have two separate sections talking about the same thing, it's a great opportunity for inconsistency. So you should only have it in one place. Basically, the site plan stuff looks at temporary buildings, and it's, it's been made much clearer when an agricultural building triggers site plan review by the planning board and when it can go in as a temporary building without getting planning board review. So uh, that's all I have for um, my presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions or sit down. Should we open the public hearing first, and then if, when we have a discussion, if we have questions, we can call Maureen back up. Uh, okay, so I'll open the public hearing on the agricultural use proposed amendments. Um, so please feel free to come forward and state your name and where you live and talk to us. Hi, I'm Carol Ann Jordan. I live at 21 Wells Road, and I am one of the members of the Cape Farm Alliance subcommittee that worked on ordinances. So I worked with the other members of the Farm Alliance for a year or so on drafting our recommendations. And then we worked with the planning board for a number of months, going through reviewing and refining our recommendations and coming to our compromises. And then I attended 7 AM meetings with the ordinance committee and, uh, again, went through the uh, our recommendations and the planning board recommendations and uh, came to a couple more compromises and I feel that that all of this effort has has put forward some good changes some really positive changes um, both for the town and for the farming community and I would hope that you would approve these changes and thank you very much thank you Caroline Good evening. 
Hi, I'm Frank Stroud, 1184 Shore Road. I emailed my comments to you, so I won't go into them in, in depth. But I had a couple of thoughts after I had sent them along. And, and one was uh, at a recent meeting of the Cape Farm Alliance, we had some farmers from another community come. And they had heard of what was happening in Cape Elizabeth, and they were excited about it. And their community was not farm friendly, as they had thought, and uh, was really excited to, to talk with us and to learn from us about how involved the town had been in working through and bringing up to speed the ordinances to make them so that they're farm friendly today as agriculture has changed over the years. It's not the way it used to be. The ordinances needed to be worked on. But they were excited to see how many different ways citizens like myself, who's not a farmer, participated with the town council and the planner and the code enforcement officer. And all these people came together to create a document that I think really works well for the town now. And I strongly encourage you to, um, to approve this tonight so we can move on. It does keep it, it, it is within the keeping of the comprehensive plan, which we've spent a lot of time working on trying to make uh, cables with farm friendly and farm viable. These are businesses in our town and we really need to support them. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Any others? Okay, I'll close the public hearing and uh, we'll discuss the amendments. Item 57, 2010. Do we have a motion? I would move for the council to approve the proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance regarding agricultural uses. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? I, I just want to, it's more of a, a uh, looking at the logistics or the or what we're trying to accomplish here. Last month we dealt with an ordinance recommendation to the, to the town council and we had no public comment. And then we moved on, on the, on the proposed amendment changes, seconded discussion, and we voted to make them. I, I only raise the question here, should we be taking the public input and moving this decision to the next meeting? And again, this whole communication strategy that we're trying to work on as a group and trying to improve citizen input into decisions in the town, uh, I just wonder if we need to be taking that into consideration today. Um, I know that this work has been in place, but underway for well over two and a half, three years. Lots of great work by lots of citizens. And we're also up against the summer growing season and some of the other major elements of farming that, that we've, we, we've tried to help here. So I just put it on the table for discussion. I don't really... I think that if we're prepared to make a decision, we should make that decision. But I also feel very strongly that we started this, this town council year trying to, to, to allow for citizen input and to have this sort of process resonate well in the community so that whatever decisions we do make, people feel completely engaged in it. Okay. Go ahead. I'm going to... I'm going to say a couple of things. I first probably should disclose that I am a member of the Cape Farm Alliance. And uh, for people who don't know, I'm also a uh, farm owner here in Cape Elizabeth. I would hope that we could, if there was a lot of opposition relative to this, Jim, I, I would agree with you. Um, we have vetted these ordinances um, through the alliance, through the, the uh, planning board, through the ordinance committee. Um, there doesn't seem to be a great, there doesn't seem to be any opposition that I have heard up to this point. And so therefore, I would hope that we could move them forward at the meeting tonight. That's, if there was, if there was some controversy around it, I could go with that. But, I really yeah, think again I'm not proposing we do this. I just want to have the discussion tonight so that the public, those folks li listening at home, understand that we're trying to make the right decision and we're trying to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. and 
I agree with you. I, I think, if anything, this is a absolute example of a community working together for the benefit of all. And uh, but I just I, I just had to bring it up because we we did have some pushback over the last decision we made. <clears throat> I actually agree with Penny. I, 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 we, I haven't heard one single person who isn't thrilled by this, so I don't sense that there's any contentiousness at all or even any opposition. But I agree with you that before, every time we hear a public hearing and then vote, we should pause and say, is this the right thing to be doing? I mean, I agree with you bringing it up. I think that was right. I'm in favor of voting for it tonight. Well, I just echo Jim work comments. I think um, if there were any opposition, whether it's material or not, I'd want to be able to listen to it and consider it. Mm -hmm. In this instance, though, I don't remember seeing any emails or any comments on it in opposition or criticism, of it, and therefore, I feel comfortable voting for it. Are there any more comments or questions about the, the amendments themselves or questions for Maureen? Everybody feels comfortable. Okay, should we vote? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you so much for everybody who worked so, so hard on these. Okay, moving along. Item 58-2010, In by the Sea license. Um, the In by the Sea annual malt, Venice, and spirit licenses are, should be considered for renewal and their annual special amusement permit. Deb, do you want to introduce it? Sure, thank you very much. You do have before you uh, the renewal license as um, Council Lennon just described. As we do, we check with our codes officer, police and fire chief to see if there are any questions or objections <coughs> for this type of less license, and there are none. Uh, we always also provide a, uh, it's not a public hearing, but a public comment opportunity before the council votes on a uh, liquor license if you would ask if there are any um, comments from the public. Other than that, this is in line to uh, be voted on this evening. Are there any comments from the public on this item? Okay, seeing none, is there a motion? Jim? I'd, I'd like to move that uh, we um, grant the uh, Ian by the Sea its annual mall in its in the spirit license as um, as stated in the application before us. I'll second. Second. Discussion? Do we need to specifically reference the special amusement permit yes. as well? So would you accept that amendment? To your I motion? can accept that amendment, sir. And if somebody could tell me how to pronounce <laughs> Venice and Spirituous, is that? <laughs> I'd, I'd appreciate that. I know it's Venice. <laughs> it's Venice. Okay. No discussion? All those in favor? <coughs> Unanimous. I'm feeling pretty well here. Uh, item 59-2010, proposed communication strategy. Um, I was hoping I could hand this over to Councilor Walsh. <laughs> Thank you very much, yes. Uh, and then I'm going uh, to hand it over to our, to our manager, who's done uh, quite a bit of work on this. Um, uh, one of the objectives we came up with this before we started this council year was to look at this whole effective communication and participation model that we were trying to, to develop here as we go. But there are a lot of other places within our communication strategy that require some attention. And what you have before you is a strategy that, that gets into everything from website to you know, you know, what this room should look like or whether we should be sitting on a dais as we speak to the public to whether we need additional um, meeting rooms in this building that can accommodate the public. So, um, you know, Michael, uh, Michael has spent a great deal of time on this um, and I think he can add um, much more value to this than I can other than the fact that it's been out there since April. It's been on the website, and I haven't haven't gotten any any sort of feedback from anybody. I don't know whether other counselors have, but we are planning to bring this to a workshop, and at that time, 
hopefully publicize and, and welcome input from the community because clearly this is all about trying to get it right in terms of what we say and what we do and what town government provides and community um, citizens understanding completely and feeling uh, part, of the, part of the process. So um, as that is a backdrop, I'd turn it over to Michael who can talk about elements within this um, strategy and certainly if there's questions or concerns or any kind of pushback from the council, uh, let's hear it. Michael? Yeah, uh, thank you, Jim. The, as Councillor Walsh mentioned, uh, one of the council goals this year, or I think he alluded to, he didn't specifically say it, is to, uh, is to enhance more effective citizen participation uh, in local government, and as part of that, to do this communication strategy. Th this draft has a number of desired outcomes. Uh, first, citizens will know where to find information, and I'm paraphrasing. Uh, two, that citizens at public meetings will be able to both hear and able to speak. I'll go into some more details later on uh, on that. Uh, citizens will have opportunities to best impact local decision making. That gets into when do citizens comment and different ways that they, they can be involved uh, and can be encouraged to be involved. Uh, municipal information will have a clearly recognized identity. The whole concept of that certain publications of the town should <clears throat> project a positive image uh, and identity for the town. Uh, and that elected and appointed officials will understand opportunities to disseminate information of interest, more training in the area of uh, communications. So then it, the report goes on to make some specific recommendations. Uh, one is that the, the first area is involving the website and uh, it recognizes the, <clears throat> the strategy that the website is where most citizens now find information uh, and that it should remain as the primary source. It should be neutral in focus, should continue to be updated on a daily basis. And I, I want to really emphasize recommendation A2. The website is not a forum for commenting on municipal issues and services. The, the website shall contain links to easily enable emails to municipal officials. While the town council, as, as Jim mentioned, have not received comments specifically on this communication strategy. Uh, the council has received some emails suggesting that uh, all emails received from citizens should be published on the town website. The recommendation in this, in this draft is that that not occur, uh, that, uh, that emails not, not all appear on the website. The, the reason for that, one is administratively uh, and time-wise, it, it, it was taking an, an awful lot of time. And in, in, in two respects, one is the physical mechanics of placing it there, and two is, is the whole issue is, is a website of an organization should as much as possible put the, the organization in a good light. And when there's people who are looking at the Cape Elizabeth schools, for instance, from around the country, you know, and they're looking at investing in Cape Elizabeth property, when you, you have all these emails that, that, that say the school department stinks or, you know, these types of words, it's, you know, not something you want to have on your website. Secondly, there's tons of information, if you read a lot of emails, that, that, is, that is accurate, but there's also a lot of information that's inaccurate. And the problem is when you leave it on the official website, there's the assumption that it's all accurate. Uh, and so as, as a result, we could have a full-time employee simply going in, and at what point do you want to go in and, you know, say that, that this comment is wrong, 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 and, you know, you, you just look at the, the recent little flap a few people had because, you know, the, the council posted on the website frequently asked questions involving Fort Williams and Fort Williams fees. You know, everyone started to pick it. Was it opinion? Was it whatever? And, you know, to what degree and how much time do you spend doing all that? So the recommendation is, is that the website should continue to have information. It should continue to be neutral. But while all of these emails are public, they're available for everyone. Uh, anyone can request them. We, we, we do uh, keep them all. That they not be on the website where they're there, where it's open to lots of misinterpretation in terms of, you know, what, what's, what's real and what isn't, uh, and, uh, you know, recognizing that, that their opinions. Uh, secondly, uh, in addition, this recommends that the website should be reorganized with, with drop-down menus uh, 
the, the website, it's, it's easy to find stuff now, but it, there aren't really categories of where you find different information. And uh, Wendy Derzewick, who is our exceptional webmaster, has been <coughs> spending some time and has a few prototypes now looking at a, a new design for the, the website. Uh, we're looking at having short videos on the website, making more multimedia uh, presentations uh, on it. We've, we've done that a little bit. It suggested we do more of it. Uh, we're not going to post council meetings on YouTube, are there, we? No, but council meetings are already on the website. <laughs> you, you, can, you can, if you wish to watch this meeting again. We might get about three hits. So. <laughs> you might. You might it must David. be conducted in rap. Exactly. Uh, and the website should also be interactive in terms of the ability to pay taxes online to register for municipal programs. Uh, a bunch of other is we ought to be more aggressive in issuing press releases. There should be more updates on various issues, like as we have going to occur, some of those things. And that not only should they be announced at meetings, but we ought to do more press releases, and we ought to archive those on the website so that uh, they're searchable and people can find out what we said we were going to do to see if we, we end up doing it. Uh, there's a recommendation that there be an electronic message sign here in the town center and at the recycling center. Uh, we used to have a message board in front of the police station, and many people enjoyed that, uh, and it was missed when it went down. And one of the issues was it had to be changed all the time, uh, but this would be now an electronic message that would put out information about elections and absentee and uh, different official information. Uh, we should continue to broadcast meetings, inserts in the tax bills, that before the council does its goal setting, that maybe in November, that there be an opportunity, maybe for, for just an open forum for folks to discuss issues and concerns uh, before the goal setting occurs. Uh, that the town council would seek opportunities to speak to local groups on municipal issue, issues. Go speak to the Cape Farm Alliance, uh, to, to CEIF, to uh, Cape for All, to all the different groups. Uh, the next set of goals relating to citizens attending meetings should be able to hear and to speak. <clears throat> this room has terrible acoustics. Uh, and sometimes you're in the back there, you can't, particularly when the room is crowded, you have real trouble hearing. We get complaints all the time that folks aren't speaking into the microphone. And either it's, it's too loud in the room or it's too soft. And it, it, there's an issue uh, with hearing. The seating is too crowded for many meetings. You look at this room, and actually, because of this raised podium, the, the, the ramp in the back, and because this is elevated, the space that the front row needs to be away from it, and the angle of it, more than half the room is taken up by this podium. Uh, if you look at like where that front row of seats are, it's, if you look at it's in it's behind the middle window. Mm -hmm. So you look at that, and because of this layout as it now is, there could be a lot more seating in here. It could be a lot more comfortable if something was done. This is 32 years old now. It was built by, by uh, Pond Cove Millwork back in 1977, 78. And uh, it's, it's been very good, served the town well, but it's, uh, it is what it is. Uh, <laughs> the conference room out back, the William H. Jordan conference room, is often overcrowded. Uh, people can't find it. The, there's heating challenges. Uh, it has a, a wheelchair lift there that's really not that accessible. Uh, it, this suggests that that room be looked at to see if perhaps some modifications could be made to make it so that it's more accessible to folks uh, and more easily uh, reachable. The second floor conference room upstairs also has a little room for the public. Basically, we have lots of meeting space in this building, but it, it really needs updating for for what the, the needs are and the, the, you know, we have two, two folks here tonight at this point, but generally when we have bigger crowds, you know, the rooms really aren't serving the needs to the degree they should be. A lot of this, if you look at it, involves uh, money, some of it, and there's no specific suggestions here. It's these things be looked at and be considered. There are some specific suggestions, but it says they'd be looked at. Uh, <clears throat> we ought to be looking at the police department surplus space to see if maybe some activities could go over there and to free this space up here for, for better meeting rooms and for you know, more accessible opportunities for the public. Uh, another recommendation, participation at meetings, 
All town council meetings and meetings of advisory boards and recommendations should provide an opportunity for members of the public to speak. Right now, there's, there's no formal opportunities at workshops. Planning board workshops don't have opportunity for public to speak. This, this recommendation is, is that each board would have procedural rules to enable participation to occur uh, while still ensuring that there's an opportunity for board to, to, want to do its deliberations. And as a result of this recommendation, the planning board already at their last meeting began to discuss how they can now have, find a way to enable the public to speak at workshops. So it is something that's being looked at. Uh, that there be 72 hour notice of meetings, uh, that every agenda would complain, uh, uh, at the bottom would be a summary of what are the rules for public participation at the council agenda would have, you know, that would take the excerpts from the council rules and print them so anyone picks up an agenda, they know uh, what the procedures are. Uh, that we, we don't have a uniform logo or mark identifying itself to town, we should consider looking into that. That we update the municipal logo. Uh, right now we have lots of different logos, lots of different, there's no single identity. You don't like this one out front? This one? Hmm? I thought we had a town seal. We have, we have a, exactly, uh, Councilor Jordan, we, we have a town seal, and if you look at our letterhead, it's not this town seal. Oh. It's, 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 there's like three different seals, plus all the different departments have their own logos and seals. And, you know, most, it's, there, there ought to be a, anyone who's a public image consultant branding. would tell you branding and that there ought to be some, you know, South Portland's done a good job. Uh, in terms of you know branding their vehicles more, and, uh, I thought we branded ourselves right there. We did. This was made by Raymond Thompson in 1977 when this podium was built, mm -hmm. and he was given a copy of something, and he designed that. It was never officially adopted, but we have photographed it in some on some of our vehicles. I have a little we have lapel that pin in it. We have a lapel pin that again looks like that, but <laughs> the the color is just it's there's no match to it. Oh. Anyway, I assumed it was the suggested we look at it. I'll, I'll <clears throat> your logo for big bucks. Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> Did you say you do it for big bucks? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we shall see. <laughs> yeah. It's, there's a suggestion in this that we undertake a strategic planning process. Uh, one of, you know, while we have the comprehensive plan for land use, it provides some strategic direction. It falls short of being a visionary document for the community. Uh, one of the problems, you know, the Municipal Operations Review Committee has struggled quite a bit, as we all know, over the last year. And one of the, in my view, it was hampered in part by a lack of consensus on a vision for municipal services in Cape Elizabeth. It was, you know, started making specific recommendations without looking at the big picture of what do we want for municipal services. And it's recommended here that we, we uh, <clears throat> that in order to have an effective communication strategy, a consensus is first needed on the overall messages desiring to be communicated and that policy development should be anchored by an overall strategy beyond that in the comp plan and through that it's suggested we do a strategic planning process. That there be communications training as I mentioned and that we also as part of our normal professional development opportunities we, we try to include things that relate to effective communication. Anyway, there's, there's all these different recommendations. Uh, the Town Council is having a workshop on June 15th at which will be discussed, and from that point, the council will decide uh, if, what additional input and uh, process beyond that point. If any, or you might want to just say, nice thing you might, but it doesn't meet our needs, so whatever. But I look forward to the discussion on June 15th and any comments that folks have as well. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Pro Tem. Do we, we don't have to make a motion or anything? We just keep moving. Uh, I think Jim might have gone. Oh, sorry. Does anybody have any input or any suggestions? Did we miss anything, or is there? Ask a question? I, I think Wait. I think I'd like to have some feedback that we can. I think it's fabulous. Thank you so much for doing it. And the only comment I have is, I really like that you emphasized the the conversation, like between councilor and citizen, citizen councilor, and citizen to citizen, which I think we need a little more work on. I agree, it shouldn't be on the website, but somehow I know I feel like citizens are craving some kind of forum or platform where they can speak to each other about issues that are before the town and that's why they miss the citizen whatever it was called so I don't know if we're in charge of sponsoring that but that's just one topic that could be 
in among all these topics. Maybe the courier would be encouraged to respond to that. Yeah. The other thing is we, we look at the, n the number of groups that meet in our town regularly and there's opportunities for us, not all of us, because some of us may not be comfortable speaking to the group, but if we could offer up our opportunity to be out there as a counselor and representing the town council and, have, and really being properly scripted and prepared to, 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 to get the message out for no other reason other than to just make ourselves accessible again. But there are tons of opportunities that we're not going after. And, and we, think, we think we need to be doing that in order for people to feel that they've got a, a local town government that's engaged in doing the right thing for the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. So, I think the, um, the majority of this deals with the municipal side. <clears throat> but when you're talking about the image of the town and some other, other elements of it, it also relates to the schools. Mm -hmm. when we should be coordinating more with them, coordinating with them as we relate. Yeah. It's a great point, Frank, because we, we, we struggled with how to put that into this document um, because we do run in two completely different tracks. They're, they're doing a, a much better job through this round of budget preparation and education with what they've done with the volunteers that they are using to do the public relations side. Um, I, I, I'm glad to have that. I think it should be in our minutes, and I think that we should, we should reach out because, again, that whole one-town concept, you know, I, I'm, I'm there. It's just, it's, it's tough. How do, you, you know, how do you do that when we both have very specific fiduciary responsibilities? But clearly there can be a, a, um, a single approach that could be employed in both houses that, that could work. But, again, we struggle with how to put it into our objective in our because we don't really have the responsibility for that right that so group. perhaps in the workshop process we encourage them to participate and yeah. see where best practices prevail maybe there's something we can borrow from them they can borrow from us yeah and, and also i think it'd be a good idea to have a image that uh, whether it's um, on the web or anything that's quite consistent and perhaps even reduce costs if we're you know not creating a real place yeah just two specific reactions. Uh, the participation at meetings recommendation, I think, is a very good one. Uh, when I was on the planning board, we would have the workshops, and there would often be folks that are there who you knew just were dying to say something. And it might have been helpful for us to hear from uh, town citizens very early on in the process. I think if you work it into the agenda and you need to sort of balance the timing commitments because it's a it's a time for the members of the committee to get work done, but if we could set aside an appropriate amount of time, I don't know what that is, 10 or 15 minutes at the beginning or the end, I think that would work. The ordinance committee meetings that most of us have sat through at one time or another, uh, we had a year's worth of meetings on some of the BA zoning amendments, and yet there was not much opportunity in those meetings to hear from those folks who came to almost every single one of them. So I think that's a, a very interesting recommendation. As far as posting emails on the website, I, I agree with the town manager. I, I don't want to go back to that. Another thing that happened, and there was nothing illegal or wrong necessarily, but a citizen who felt very strongly about an issue looked at all the emails and then started communicating with all those folks who chimed in on that issue. And again, nothing wrong with that, but what started happening was people started hitting reply to all, and folks who didn't necessarily want to get emails back on Fort Williams were then inundated and it was driving them crazy. So uh, I think some people may have an expectation that if they send an email to the council, that's sort of the end. They may hear back from some or all of us, but they're not going to hear from folks in the community. So um, I, I think that's a good recommendation. And if anybody wants to see them, they can. I mean, it just is a bit more of a process. And so we're less apt to have that sort of email explosion that we experienced for 20 or 30 folks. Jessica, um, I, I would agree with most of what Dave said um, with respect to uh, working hard to um, encourage citizen input at meetings and planning board meetings and various other committee meetings. Um, <clears throat> I wonder, Mike, if uh, how we compare website-wise with other communities with respect to citizen emails. 
Do you know how some of the others are managing that? And I ask that because while I, I truly appreciate the logistical problem of the citizen email issue, nevertheless, it is a vehicle that I've certainly heard many, many positive and negative complaints about and people feel that they want to have this ability. So I would uh, encourage um, continued exploration of that possibility. And, and I want to ask Mike what, what other towns are doing. Yeah, I do not know of any other community that publishes on its website all the emails that it receives from citizens that are addressed to the elected officials. Okay. If anyone knows of anything differently, if they could send me an email, I would appreciate it and would be happy to look at those websites. Penny and then Ann. Um, I have a couple of things, and I don't know how much detail you want to go into. Um, number one, I think this is good work. I think embedded in here are a lot of different things. Uh, it's not just a communication strategy. I'll kind of go to some of the things that Mike said. It's, uh, it includes a, a branding strategy. It includes um, um, a visioning that needs to happen. So it's really not just a communication strategy. Communication is just one component of this. And I think the doc, as I read through the document, I would have kind of flipped it over and said, let's start at vision of the town. What, what, is, what does that look like? How do we start uh, creating a brand relative to that? And then you start building kind of the, uh, the, the um, pieces that come off that communication strategy being one of them. I, I'm a firm believer in leveraging technology um, and using it to uh, the best of our ability in order to create an ongoing dialogue because from my perspective uh, a communication is about an exchange it's not just about pushing information out and uh, there needs to be that that ongoing dialogue I agree with you Mike that I don't believe that our town website is the place where we should house the emails and those responses, but yet we need to come up with what is that solution and whether it be a courier website or something, but we have to give people a, um, I guess an alternative so that they know that if we're going to have an exchange and leverage this technology that's out there and everybody can share their ideas, their thoughts, and their opinions, we've got to give people a place to do that because that's the pent-up energy out there. So bottom line, I think there's a lot here. I think that our, our workshop, uh, we can kind of delve into this in a lot more detail, but I have a ton of questions around it. But I don't think you want to do that here tonight. Um. This will be brief because I can't speak for very long, but um, I, I agree that the free and open exchange of ideas is really important. And I think we come to matter decisions when we get more information from the citizens and when we sort of have it be a two-way street. However, I do not, I agree with Councillor Sherman and several others that it, I don't think it's the function of government of local government at least, um, to be providing uh, a blog for um, citizens to use. We have so many things that we can't do now because we don't have the resources to do. And um, I think what happened is if you actually look at the facts, as I tried to do last spring, that um, there were about 400 citizens who in the previous year had sent emails to that blog to the to Cape Citizen and 300 of them sent one email in the whole year and there were really about 14 or 15 people who sent a huge percentage of the emails and just in terms of a cost efficiency factor it seems odd to me that we would spend so much of our webmaster's time and energy 
um, and frankly, a lot of managerial oversight on some of the issues that came up there when um, it's only 10 or 15 people being served. I really think in this time of shrinking budgets and shrinking workforces that government cannot do everything. And I think right, that the press provides a wonderful avenue and, and private blogs provide a wonderful avenue for folks who want to have a, a dialogue with each other, not with us, but with each other about a variety of issues. I think, I think that's great. They can do that. As long as we can get good information from our citizens and, and we can have a good dialogue, that's great. But I really don't think it was a successful experiment in terms of being a good use of our very limited financial resources. Thanks for bearing with my voice. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. just one more comment. Um, in the interest of the one town concept, um, I, uh, with respect to the schools, our, our school department's website I find very difficult to use. I find it harder than the town's. And I've been very impressed with the Falmouth School Department's website with its ease, its transparency of information. Um, and so I would encourage Jim to take a look at that if he hasn't already. And, and I know that you'll be talking to the school folks about, you know, kind of merging or doing some sort of exchange of ideas and information. But um, it's, it's worth looking at. I just have a practical um, suggestion following up on that. Mary Townsend is the uh, liaison, is the communications, <clears throat> I don't know her title. She's the head of communications for the school board. And I think she's done a fabulous job. And she, she was the person who hired the volunteer. And I've heard great things about the volunteer across the board from all perspectives in the school. So it'd be nice to have her at our meeting because she could just, she sent, she's two steps ahead in some ways of where we are. And we could, she could know what we were doing and vice versa. And the other person is Megan McConnell, who um, is a fabulous web designer, and she might have some input on, not only does she design websites, but she knows all these communication tools, and she did the PCPA one, and it's, it's quite interactive and interesting. So she may be willing to come as well, just two people in town who I think would be helpful. Dave. Sarah, I, there just may have been one passing comment, and I can't remember who said it, but the, the Cape Courier is independent of the town of Cape Elizabeth. So to the extent anybody believes that the, the, the courier could somehow implement our strategy, that, that's not possible because they're independent. And I hope I'm not contradicting myself here, but I do understand that the courier is uh, in, in need of the town support. So for those out there who really value the courier and think it, they provide a useful service, I happen to believe that it does. Uh, I know in past issues they have asked for folks to make financial contributions, and I hope I'm not stepping in, in, in a uh, minefield here, but uh, to those who value it, I would certainly encourage you to do that. Thank you. Should we move along? Is everyone? Great. Thank you very much. I will look forward to the workshop where we'll hash all this out much no, it's greater great. length. Uh, it's good input. Glad everybody participated. Thank you. Item 46, 2010, the policy related to down trees on public property. Um, do you need a motion to repeal something? Is that how we proceed here? I'd, well, or do you want to talk? Yeah, yeah. Just briefly, we, we, the council a few years ago enacted a policy relating to down trees on public property. When we recently looked at it, it was clear that it, it contradicts what's already in the tree ordinance. An ordinance has, has uh, uh, priority over a, 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 a policy. So what I'm suggesting is that you repeal, you actually repeal the, the policy because most of it's covered in the tree ordinance. And then, without terribly overburdening the ordinance committee, what I'd like to suggest is that uh, the staff prepare a recommendation for a few minor amendments to the tree ordinance uh, that then uh, that, you, that you ask the ordinance committee to review the tree ordinance. And we'll, the staff will try to be as helpful as we can to make it not burdensome. So is there a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. 
you. Thank you, Ordinance Chair, for letting us <laughs> move everything back onto your desk. Sarah. Yeah. Just procedurally, that last item should have been taken off the table. And I, the, 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 the chairman over here, my chair, excuse me, what chair. What have you been taken off the table? That last item was, was on the table, it needed to come off the table. It was, it was table. Yeah, you need yeah. to backtrack a little bit. Okay. To make it legal. Item 46, 2010, policy related to down trees on public property. I move to take it off the table. Second. All in favor? Unanimous. Now, do we have a motion? That we had before, of uh, to recommend it to repeal this policy and send it to the ordinance committee. Send the current tree ordinance to the ordinance committee for some tweaking. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Well, <laughs> <laughs> item 60-2010. Alternative Energy Committee recommendation. Um, Do you want me to get background on this? Yeah, why don't you? Be great. The Alternative Energy Committee a month or two ago met with some counselors and essentially spelled out the, the recommendations they have for um, energy saving, cost saving, and um, trying to make our town a little bit greener. And it was a fabulous presentation, and, but it was this big spreadsheet with tons of numbers and um, we worked our way through it, and at the end, Councillor Swift Kata suggested that if they could present the same information in a more, more of a narrative so that it was easier to understand, that would be very helpful for us as councillors going forward and explaining it to the citizenry. So they took it back and they did that, which is what you currently have in your packet. And um, I want to thank them for yet more work, and I think it is actually very helpful to have it in this format. So. Um, we no formal action needs to be taken right now because I think what we need there was the final piece of it that much of the recommendations are resting on is whether we can have natural gas piped into the town and we can heat our buildings and and power our buildings on natural gas and we don't know the answer to that because Unital um, hasn't told us the price correct I they did today oh. so we still want to put this back to a workshop? I believe we so. Want to, we should accept the, 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 the current addition to the package, and we should move this to be at a future workshop where we consider what we great. want to do with it. Um, so is there a motion? So moved. Second. Um, all those in favor? Unanimous. Item 61-2010, school budget validation vote warrant. Deborah does all these. Deborah, yeah. you want to give us the background? Yes, thank you very much. Um, state law still requires that municipal officers sign the warrant for local elections. A few years ago, um, state law changed the, the um, requirement that municipal officers sign a warrant for state so that's why you don't see a state a warrant for state ballots here that is signed by the town clerk. So you do for the um, municipal elections. The first one that is prepared is calling for the school budget validation referendum. Um, the language that you have before you is um, the language that is required um, by the statute. It's the uh, yes and no vote on do you favor approving the town of Cape Elizabeth school budget for the upcoming school year that was adopted at the latest school budget meeting of the council. Um, there's also, um, this is the third year, so there's an additional question. Do you wish to continue the budget validation referendum process in Cape Elizabeth for an additional three years? There's also an informational note on there that is required as well. Uh, again, it calls for the election on Tuesday, June 8th at the high school gymnasium. Polls open 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. It describes the absentee balloting process and the availability of the registrar of voters as well. Thank you. David? Um, I don't know if any of the members of the council happened to catch the article in today's Press Herald about the, the validation process and how some communities have required three or four, three or four votes in their community to 
get a school budget passed and they didn't seem to have the benefit of the advisory question that we, we have used in the last two elections, which is uh, after the citizen votes on whether they favor approving the town of Cape Elizabeth school budget, we asked the advisory question uh, of, I find the school budget adopted at the town council school budget meeting to be too high, acceptable, or too low. And I think that's a very important piece of this process because if the town's voters did vote not to approve the budget, we as a council, I think, would want the direction as to where then the next budget should be set, whether it should be higher or lower. So I, I would uh, suggest that in between those two questions that are on the proposed warrant, after the first question, do you favor approving the town of Cape Elizabeth school budget for the upcoming school year that was adopted at the latest school budget meeting of the town council, we then insert that advisory question, which I'd be happy to read for the record. Can you make it a motion so then we can, don't we need to vote to get it put in? You, you need a motion, but I think he's on the verge. Okay. okay. So shall I go ahead and make a yeah. motion and then um, just... Then we can discuss it. Okay, fair enough. I would move then that in addition to the warrant as uh, drafted in our package, we include the advisory question. That would follow the first question on the proposed warrant. And the advisory question would read, I find the school budget adopted at the May 25, 2010 Town Council school budget meeting to be too high, acceptable, or too low. Those would be the three options that the voter could fill in. And then the warrant would then continue with the next question, which is, do you wish to continue the budget validation referendum process in Cape Elizabeth for an additional three years? So there would be three questions relating to the school budget on the warrant. Second. Discussion? I actually have a question just in anticipation that this might come up. I went back to um, the ballot language that the council had adopted for the September 2nd, 2008 school budget where it talked about the too high, acceptable, too low. Um, just before that question I find the school budget, um, you had advisory question of the Cape Elizabeth school budget. The following is a non-binding expression of opinion for the consideration of the school board and town council. I find the school budget adopted at the, and this will be the May 25th, 2010, town council school budget meeting to be too high, acceptable, too low. Would it, you may want to consider um, that same language. Just and I would actually be happy to amend my motion to include that because I do think that's important. And it's also, I think consistency is also important. I, the town's voters are used to seeing the question this way. I think it will then avoid confusion. And I, I accept, I second that amendment. Uh, the question, um, the word acceptable, um, <coughs> some of the, we've had some discussion about whether that word is correct or whether it should be appropriate. It's, it, you know, it's the too high, too low, or acceptable, too high, too low, or appropriate. I, I just, just wonder about the, the, the wording, that's all, uh, because all the work that's gone into putting the budget in front of people, you know, whether it's acceptable or not, it's appropriate, given the current economics and some of the other decisions being made by all the bodies involved. I, I would argue for the language that David proposed, the acceptable. For one thing, it's consistent with what we've done the last couple of years. And I think the word appropriate somehow um, um, implies an endorsement. And I think there are some people who will say, well, it's not great, but I find it acceptable, okay? I'll, I, don't, you know, I don't think it's too high, I don't think it's too low. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's exactly appropriate. We went around and around and around on this language two years ago, um, and that's what we came up with. But I would like to stay consistent with what we've done the last two years, the words we've used the last two years, just because I think the public has sort of gotten used to those words. I agree with Ann on both counts. Uh, sort of getting back to my earlier comment on consistency, I, I, I just, if we insert a new word, I might not think there's much of a difference, but it, it, it could just cause a lot of perhaps unnecessary discussion or confusion. 
Do you mind reading the sentence once more, Dan? The sentence leading up to the right. It, the, it would be advisory question of the cable as a school budget. The following is a non-binding expression of opinion for the consideration of the school board and town council. I find the school budget adopted at the May 25th, 2010 town council school budget meeting to be too high, acceptable, too low. Thanks. I brought along a copy of it in writing that David has. If anybody wants to just look at it. Any further comments? All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Item 62-2010, Municipal Advisory Referendum Warrant. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is the warrant for the special municipal referendum which is the uh, question, would you favor the town establishing a pay display parking program for Fort Williams Park? This language you approved at your February council meeting. Uh, and again, it goes on to uh, call for the election on Tuesday, June 8th at the high school from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Seconded. Discussion? Frank? I may have missed it here, but um, the referendum is a non-binding vote, isn't it? Can we say that here? It's a, it's advisory referendum that, advisory that's referendum. on the ballot, yes. Do you think we need to be clearer about that, or is that fine? Ballots have been printed. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> on an appropriate and acceptable. <laughs> Just is it on its own page, right? <coughs> Isn't it a whole separate? It is. Okay. All those in favor? Unanimous. Item 63, 2010, Voter Registration Appeals Board. Thank you very much. Uh, by state law, um, Cape Elizabeth is required to have a Voter Registration Appeals Board in the event a person appeals the decision of the Registrar of Voters. Um, per state law, the two um, municipal committees, the Democratic and Town Republican committees, uh, make their recommendations. Actually, they make their appointments, uh, which they have. Um, that information is in your packet. The um, Town Committee members for Democrat is James Wagner and alternate Rebecca Millett. Republican Town Committee nominated Ruth Ann Haley and appointed uh, William Gross as the alternate. The um, third member of the committee is recommended by the town clerk. Um, and it, I am pleased um, to present David Backer um, as the um, town clerk's recommendation for the Voter Registration Appeals Board. The town clerk's recommendation also serves as the chairman of the board. Um, the town committee members serve a three-year term, and um, Mr. Backer, if approved, would serve a four-year term. I would recommend that you uh, approve that appointment. Thank you. And thank you, David Backer. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Item 64, 2010, election clerks. Thank you very much. Uh, before you is a list of uh, residents um, who we may call upon, upon to serve uh, as election clerks in the various elections. There, again, this is by uh, state law that um, a list be approved every two years. Um, if we need to go beyond the list to get enough um, election staff to serve at elections, uh, we may do so, again, by state law. Uh, also in this, I am recommending the continuance of Sharon Gower to serve as our warden, uh, Jacqueline Coy as deputy warden, and myself as deputy warden as well. Uh, this will be in order for your approval this evening. Thank you. Uh, do we have a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. I'll second it. <laughs> Discussion? Yes. Uh, Carol Murray appears on both 
the um, Democratic list and the unenrolled voters list? Uh, Carol should be on the bees. Okay. Thank you. So we remove her from the unenrolled yes. voters list. Okay. Anything else? Just a question. These are all volunteers. No, we do provide a um, per hour fee. I think the election clerks are like eight twenty-five or eight fifty an hour. Uh, all those in favor? Item 65, 2010, MMA Legislative Policy Committee. The Maine Municipal Association is requesting nominations to serve on the MMA Legislative Policy Committee for a two-year term beginning in July 2010. Ann Swift Kayata is our current representative. Um, I'll accept. No, I'd like to nominate. I would <laughs> Continue in that capacity. Thank you. I, would, I will second, third, and fourth. With that. our gratitude. With our enormous gratitude. Do we have to vote on it? Mm. So, do I have a motion? I move that Ann Swift Oh, sorry. And a second. Uh, all those in favor? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. This time, we have an opportunity for citizens uh, to come forward for discussions of items not on the agenda. Seeing none, uh, do we have a. Uh, I just had a quick announcement about upcoming meetings. Okay. just want to remind the council that you're meeting later this week uh, with, the, uh, with representatives of the school board uh, on the budget uh, for, in a finance committee meeting, and then it's followed by, the, the regular, uh, by a special town council meeting. That's on uh, the 13th. Can I just clarify, the, the, the school board isn't all required to be there, correct? They just can come if they want, or is it a joint You're session? the chairman of the finance committee. Ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we should invite whoever wants to, but not require it, since we That's had fine. it last week. The, the agenda item that follows will have three items, uh, the agenda that will follow. One is setting for public hearing the, the municipal school community services county budget. A second one is all of the special funds. And a third item is, I believe, we have a tenant for the the space in the front of the community, in the back of the community, in the back of the house at the community center, in the front of the community center, but the back of the house. And, uh, so we might have a tenant. We may have a tenant. For where? Someplace. A little bit of space, and <laughs> you know the house that's in the front of the community center next to the IGA. Yeah. We own that, and yeah. there's an Edward Jones office yeah. in the front. Well, in the back of that front building, there's a couple of small rooms that. Uh, someone wishes to lease, and I think we'll be ready by tomorrow. And they'd like to be there by June 1, so. To live in or do business? To do business. Do we have to vote on it? it, it would, it's Thursday, you'd have to vote to approve leases. So I just wanted you to be, you'll get the agendas for that uh, tomorrow sometime. Thank you. Anything else? It'll be posted online. Do we have a motion for, to adjourn? I so move. Seconded. All in favor? Could you all get back to Deb on Memorial Day, whether or not you're going? No, I have forgotten about that. Oh, yeah, if you it. could. And then uh, June 8th, just a reminder that the town offices will be not open for regular business the primary day, because most of our employees are going to be at the polls working. Good. So can you remind us just when the parade is again? Um, 31st. What time? It starts at 9. It starts at 9. Okay. about 10 minutes early. Rick, can you get the on-air sound? Are we? All set.